Robin, thanks so much for joining with us. The revival at Asbury University in Kentucky is now in its 10th day, and it's attracting national attention as thousands of people are traveling from around the country to join in this move of God. And students tell CBN News they just don't want to leave the revival meeting, and they explain how God has ministered to them. Wendy Griffith brings us the story from Wilmore, Kentucky. This revival is officially in overflow mode. Look at this line behind me, about a half a mile long. Folks from all over the country waiting patiently to get into Hughes Auditorium here at Asbury University to experience this historic revival for themselves. God is here. God is here and he's working right now. Come get you some. You hear me? Well, that's exactly. I'm, I was like, I'm 29 year old Joa Perez drove all the way from Florida to ask God a simple question. I came here and I'm like, Lord, if you want me to go back to preaching, if you want me to plant this church that I've had in my heart and for years to plant, I need someone to prophesy over me right now. Joe's prayer was answered when he ran into a well-known local preacher. He prays over me and he literally just declares what I've been praying for years over my life. And I thought that was insane. Yeah. Regent University. Yeah. Jeff Gosman with Regent University drove 10 hours from Virginia Beach after hearing about what God is doing here. Well, everybody at Regent right now, including all the executive vice presidents, they're all crying out for revival. You know, they're having extra prayer services over there right now. They, they want the presence of the Lord on campus. And, um, and so we're just so thankful that they sent us here you know, to just get whatever we can to bring back. On Thursday, the persistent rains did not dampen spirits for those waiting to get inside. You know, uh, when I was saved, I got the Holy Spirit, but always looking for more and really hoping when I walk through the doors, it's poured out on me. 21-year-old student body president Allison Perfader was there when revival broke out. Um, because you just didn't want to leave. It's not that anyone was saying, oh, let's see how long we can last. Let's see how, you know, like we just didn't want to go. And I, I mean, I had, I had came in, I had a lot of like anger issues. I like really struggled with my anger and I was able to talk with like God first. And it's just like that never would have happened like on my own time. It's been just a really hard couple of years. Mm. And not just for me, but like a lot of my friends. Yeah. And I just felt like the Lord was releasing me of a lot of bitterness and anger that I'd had just about all kinds of stuff, even some of it towards God. And so I would say for me personally, the biggest word I can use has been a very, very healing experience yeah. for me. So how do you explain what's happening here at Asbury? I would just say there is a tangible presence of God's peace, joy, and a freedom to worship and adore the one true God. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Wilmore, Kentucky. Well, it's obviously what is going on there is revival. And it's that true revival of repentance where you turn away from the things that are distracting you from God. I love the honesty of that young woman, Allison, saying, I had so much anger in me, uh, but I, I didn't want to leave this presence. I didn't want to, you know, say, well, the service is over. It's time to go. I, I wanted to stay here. I wanted to be healed of that. I wanted that presence in my life, and I want to carry that with me. If you want revival in your life, Jesus laid out some very simple rules in the Sermon on the Mount and here's just one of them. If it's from Matthew chapter 5. You, you can read it in your Bible. It's right there. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. It's a commandment. You shall be filled. The condition is, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Not for some manifestation, but for his righteousness. You can't get it on your own. When he comes to you and brings that righteousness to you as a free gift, it changes everything. And with that righteousness comes peace and comes joy in the Holy Spirit. You know that you're right with God. It's wonderful what happens when you know that.
You can go to Kentucky and get this. It's wonderful when you're with a whole group of people that are hungry and are thirsty and want more of God. But you can also have it right where you are. How do I know that? Because God is with you right now. His manifest presence wants to come over you. You can have the same thing. Just have the same condition. Just say, Lord, I'm, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of what I've become and, and the things that I do. I am hungry. I am thirsty for the righteousness that comes from you. His promise over you is absolute. They shall be filled. So, Charlene and I are going to pray for you right now. We're going to pray that the manifest presence of God would come to you. All you have to do is declare. God's just looking for a little sign. God, I'm hungry. I, I want you. I'm thirsty. Can you fill me? Can you give me that living water, your righteousness, not anything I do, not uh, you know how much willpower I have, but can you give me your righteousness? And he'll do it if you just ask. Let's pray. Lord God, we see what you're doing in Kentucky, and, and it makes us hungry. It makes us thirsty. So Lord, we ask now that you would fill us we turn away from anything that would hinder. We turn away from our secret sins, our secret compulsions. Lord, we want all anger, all malice, all wrath to leave us and be filled with your love, your righteousness, your peace, and your joy. Come be with us, Lord God. Be Emmanuel and fill us to overflowing. We're hungry, we're thirsty, and we need you. So come, fill us to overflowing, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We're going to be covering the uh, revival in Kentucky and certainly covering it as, as it spreads. It's wonderful. I'm just hearing from all over the nation as well as all over the world, people looking at this and saying, we want that. So, you know, get, get hungry, get thirsty, and ask for more of God, and come together, and, and, and just, it's in that gathering together of hungry and thirsty people that you get this wonderful banquet laid out by God. He wants to give it to his children. All we have to do is ask and ask in faith. Well, in other news, uh, there's... We're going to go to politics now. Uh, I think Washington, D.C. needs to get hungry and thirsty, too. So anyway, President Biden has finally spoken publicly about the uh, UFOs, the military shutdown. Yet even after his remarks, many important questions still remain unanswered. Mark Martin has that story from the CBN newsroom. Mark. Gordon, the president saying the government believes the objects were not a national security threat. Still among the questions about those flying phenomena, where they came from, and who they belong to. One theory has come up that one of the objects was actually a hobby club balloon. CBN's Jenna Browder brings us the story from Washington. In addition to not being a national security threat, President Biden says these unidentified objects are not related to the Chinese spy balloon and were shot down out of an abundance of caution. We don't yet know exactly what these three objects were, but nothing, nothing right now suggests they were related to China's spy balloon program. These three objects were most likely balloons tied to private companies, recreation, or research institutions. The three objects were detected after NORAD recalibrated its radar to detect smaller objects. It's still unclear, though, where they came from. One might have belonged to a hobby club. Aviation Week reports the Northern Illinois Bottle Cap Balloon Brigade estimates their balloon was flying over the Yukon Territory the same day the U.S. military shot down an object at the same altitude and same general area. Definitely smaller than a car. In the future, Biden says he wants clear rules for situations with unidentified objects in the sky. I've directed my team to come back to me with sharper rules for how we will deal with these unidentified objects moving forward, distinguishing, distinguishing between those that are likely to pose safety and security risks that necessitate action and those that do not. His comments coming after lawmakers from both parties pressured the administration for more transparency and call for tougher action with China over its spy balloon. 
We ought to be much more forceful than we have been with the Chinese government. We ought to be saying to them that this is espionage on our soil, this is a deliberate act by them. On the one hand, the administration is saying we don't yet know what these last three objects are and we don't want to characterize them until we recover them. But on the other hand, it wasn't a threat. Both of those things can't be true. So that's why it's urgent that President Biden resolve these contradictions. President Biden's comments did little to satisfy his critics, as Capitol Hill is hoping for a more coherent policy in the days ahead. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy drawing attention to another major problem facing the Biden administration, the crisis at the southern border. McCarthy visiting the Arizona border with Mexico Thursday with a congressional delegation where he criticized Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. No one believes our border is secure. Not the border agents, not America. Mayorkas has no integrity to continue to say that. He has no integrity to continue to shut down and make it more difficult for the border agents to do their job. McCarthy said only the Sinaloa drug cartel knows who is crossing the border. Turning overseas now, recovery efforts following Turkey's massive earthquakes are underway and new issues are coming up every day. CBN's Chris Mitchell is on the ground there and explains how the widespread infrastructure damage has created a great need for medical help. As nations worldwide send help and supplies into Turkey, Syria's President Assad has opened his country's borders for the first time in years so aid can reach those areas also devastated by the earthquakes. One of the major needs in this area is medical help. The local hospital was destroyed and many people lost their prescriptions and medicine during the earthquake. That's where Operation Blessings medical team comes in. All this is good except this part. Operation Blessing Dr. Gustavo Angel is providing assessments for some in this area. For now, people are like in need of their med the treatments for the chronic diseases because at the moment they don't have any clinics or any hospitals nearby. They had to travel like at least one hour and a half from this place to the nearest clinic. This 84-year-old man suffers from diabetes, high blood pressure, and a heart condition. His son described to us what they endured when the earthquake hit. We try to keep him from falling down, and this earthquake affected him a lot, because this is the first time in a disaster like this. I took him out of my back, and he fell down, and he couldn't walk. Reliving that night proved emotionally overwhelming. The emotional aftershock is also affecting this 70-year-old survivor. They have lost everything right now. So they're living on the streets, on a tent camp. So the weather, like the fear and everything has generated a, a spasm on his muscles. So he has like an aftershock um, uh, anxiety. This son is grateful for the help. We didn't expect to get this much help at the earthquake. So not only these people who are helping us and from other organizations. To meet the need here, Operation Blessing is working to expand its medical outreach. Right now, Operation Blessing is trying to improve the, the health situation over here. We're trying to give like a mobile clinic from this area so we can go visit places or at least the people that are nearby can approach to us and we can help them because we know that they are in need. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Hatay, Turkey. It's wonderful to see Operation Blessing right there in the heart of the worst of the devastation, helping folks out, Gordon. And we're there in your name, and we're there in the name of Jesus. Why do we go to places like this? Because the love of Christ compels us. Unfortunately, I've heard on some feeds that uh, Christians are questioning why, why are we going to help Muslims? Well, we're going because we're Christian, and this is what we do. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, that we love people, and we love them in their time of need. His commandment over us is, is so evident. Let us clothe the naked. Let's Feed the hungry. Let's provide shelter for those in need. Let's provide medical care. 
Let's love our neighbor as ourselves. Let us do these things, not because of anything good or bad that they have done, because this is who we are. We are Christians, and we reach out with hands of love and compassion. So if you'd like to join in what we're doing, there's so many groups marshalling together, uh, to coming together to say, yes, let's help these wonderful people in Turkey. They're made in the image of God. They're our brothers, our sisters. We want to help them. If you want to be a part of it, it's real simple. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us. 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to join in the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just that simple. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. You can write to CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Just put Disaster Relief Fund in the memo line of a check, or you can go to cbn.com or ob.org. Either way, and, and if you give to the Disaster Relief Fund, uh, your funds will be designated in that to provide help for people in disasters all over the world and right now for that disaster, that earthquake in Turkey and Syria. We want to be there for them. So we're there in your name, and we're there because we're Christian. 1-800-700-7000. Potential Chinese spies in the sky. Only this time, the concern isn't about a balloon. It's over drones flying over our nation's capital. CBN's Matt Galka brings us this look at the, the possible threats buzzing around restricted airspace over Washington, D.C. Recreational drones have been creating a growing buzz for years. The ability to provide stunning views and unique perspectives has driven the drone market to a billion dollar industry in the United States. This soaring popularity has also put these flying machines on Capitol Hill's radar, especially given tensions with China. The world's largest recreational drone maker is Chinese owned company DJI. And alarm bells ring as drones keep popping up around Washington, D.C. Here's why. If you look behind me, there is no capital, there are no monuments, there's no D.C. And that's because there's not supposed to be. Washington, D.C. has some of the strictest drone laws in the country. And at minimum, drones are supposed to be at least 15 miles away. That's why we're in Fairfax County, Virginia. This FAA map shows the no-fly zones around the nation's capital. The red ring shows a strict no-fly zone covering a 15-mile radius around D.C. The outer ring allows for drone flights with altitude and other restrictions. Most drones come equipped with internal GPS that automatically limits the ability to fly in restricted areas. But that hasn't stopped increasing flybys. This report from Politico details classified briefings presented to Senate committees about hundreds of drones detected around the Capitol. Homeland Security warned last summer about the potential for foreign adversaries to hack drones for spying or cyber attacks. What we know is that the threat posed by UAS is widespread across the country and it is critical that our partners have the authority to help protect the homeland. Homeland Security Committee member Senator Rick Scott attended that hearing. Let's wake up. I mean, since I've been up here, I've been saying we, our federal government has got to stop buying Chinese-made drones. These are just you know, just can be used for surveillance, um, and they are, uh, as far as we know. So our government shouldn't be buying them, our military shouldn't be buying them. Senator Scott has introduced multiple bills to curb the use of foreign-made, specifically China-made, drones in government. The encounters in restricted airspace means someone hacked or manipulated the drones to bypass the geofencing. Whether malicious or not, it poses a problem. And I think the way to think about it, what can you do? You can make sure you don't buy Chinese products. Uh, you don't use TikTok. You can make sure that you never buy a Chinese drone. Regarding the restricted airspace encounters, DJI told Politico, quote, unfortunately, while DJI puts everything in place to identify and notify our customers about areas in which they can't fly, we can't control the end user's behavior. Fear over spying and data collection by China has only heightened in recent weeks. A new House Select Committee on China will now focus on threats and competition from the Asian superpower. More lawmakers want TikTok banned or to force the popular app to be sold to an American company due to potential spying threats. And the flyby and eventual takedown of a Chinese spy balloon after it sailed over America has only turned up the heat. South Dakota Congressman Dusty Johnson sits on the new China Select Committee. 
So whether we're talking, talking drone technology, whether we're talking wireless technology, whether we're talking apps, uh, that big tech uh, is rolling out in coordination with CCP, we do need to be a lot more thoughtful, planful, and deliberate in how we deal with this threat. Uh, we know that China is a technological leader in drones, and uh, they don't have to be, uh, it's not just weather balloons uh, that are spying on Americans. I suspect drones are doing a fair amount of the activity as well. The good news in this divided Congress, a crackdown on the spying threat appears to have bipartisan support. California Democrat Ro Khanna also sits on the new select committee. Do you feel like drones will come up also when we're talking about apps that the Chinese government may or may not have access to? Absolutely. We need to, uh, first of all, have our capability on drones, on AI, on satellite imaging, on quantum, uh, really enhanced. And one of the challenges is that a lot of this is now commercial technology, not DOD technology, so we need to adopt that commercial technology better. But we also need to be careful about the commercial technology that China has. At least part of the investments backing DJI come from the Chinese government. The links have led to multiple government agencies here, including the Pentagon and the Department of Defense, to ban buying the drones for their agencies, except in limited circumstances. But another potential problem, the drones are used by local law enforcement across the country as the machines are increasingly used to help first responders. Matt Gelka, CBN News. Well, technology has great promise. You look at these, these drones and the, the ability to help firefighters, the ability to help police, uh, the ability to help military, uh, and you go, yes, that's, that's a good thing. But the other side of it is quite dark, and that is the ability to surveil people and to surveil government. So in the wrong hands, this can get very dangerous, and we need to make sure that we have a free and open society. And in a surveillance culture, you don't have that. Charlene? Morgan Peterson had a mass growing inside her and a baby who didn't seem to be growing at all. She was only a few weeks pregnant, and doctors were already fearing the worst. They said if it wasn't a question of if, it was when she was going to lose her baby. And through the litany of bad news, Morgan felt powerless. So she turned to the power of prayer. I went to go to the bathroom and after I'd looked down and I saw blood and that's not something you wanna see ever being pregnant. Morgan and Luke Peterson had been thrilled to learn they were four weeks pregnant in October, 2021. Now, a week later, they feared for their baby's life. When Morgan first started bleeding, my initial thought was that we were losing the baby actively, which threw me into a tailspin. I was so distraught. Morgan and Luke prayed and also called several friends and family to pray for them. I immediately put my hands on her belly and started praying, and I just started thanking the Lord for healing and for making sure that this little one that was in there was okay. Luke drove Morgan to the hospital emergency room but had to stay in his car due to COVID regulations. Alone in the waiting room, Morgan started reading Psalm 91, a prayer asking God to deliver one from all troubles. And the verses were so uplifting, like, I'm going to protect you, I am with you. And I knew that same verse applied to my baby. There was a, a peace in the sense that I knew whatever was going on, on in that moment was going to be okay. An ultrasound test revealed Morgan had a blood clot in her uterus and a cyst on her left ovary. At only five weeks old, the baby's heart was too faint to register. And I remember seeing a little small like circle and I had no idea what it was. And the doctor was like, hey, this is your baby. And, but I didn't see any movement, I didn't see anything. So immediately there was that terrifying feeling seeping in. Doctors told them they couldn't tell if the baby was alive and sent Morgan home on bed rest to wait. It would get worse. By the end of two weeks, the amniotic sac was completely surrounded by blood, and doctors had found a mass near the uterus. So in the doctor's mind at that point, it wasn't an if, it was a when. The baby wasn't going to make it because there's just not a lot of comebacks in that kind of situation. Now, people from their church and friends were agreeing with the couple and their family in prayer. My prayers were constant throughout all of this bad news that we kept receiving, and I just kept thanking God for healing no matter what I heard. 
because I truly believed that it was in his hands. Morgan admits it wasn't always easy. And having to fully trust and place my faith in the Lord to handle all of that, it's hard. I was completely powerless. Then at Morgan's next ultrasound a week later, there was no sign of a mass or blood around the amniotic sac. Luke is like, I knew he would do it. I knew he would do it. And then that's when I remember feeling the excitement bubble, like we're in the clearing. Like we've made it through this. Then there were actually doctors asking the question saying, is this the same person? Is this the same uterus? And it was just miraculous. Their need for prayer and a miracle, however, wasn't over. At 33 weeks, Morgan went into early labor and was admitted to the hospital. After several hours, her blood pressure and heart rate dropped dramatically, as did the babies. Morgan became unresponsive. Doctors said if she didn't improve soon, they'd need to do an emergency cesarean section to save her and her baby's life. Luke, who was by her bedside, prayed, texting and calling everyone he knew to pray again. The thought of losing not only her, but losing this person that we made together was heartbreaking. And there was nothing that I could do in that moment, just sit along, alongside her and pray. After several hours and much prayer, Morgan and the baby stabilized. Three days later on May 18th, 2022, Morgan went into labor again. This time, she gave birth to a healthy boy they had named Simon, weighing four pounds and 11 ounces. I just remember seeing him and I was like, I've known you, it seems like forever. And it was like, he knew me. And it was just so, so, so precious. And it was every answer like to prayer that I could have ever wished for. To see Morgan um, <laughs> take him in, in her arms um, was, was something special. She was so beautiful in that moment. And I, I remember standing and looking at him as I held him and just saying, thank you, Lord, over and over again. Although born premature, Simon had no complications and was home within a week. Today, he's a normal, healthy toddler. The Petersons know the blessing of their healthy child was all because of prayer and trusting in God's healing power. And I know today, having such a beautiful family, my wife and my son, it all comes from being able to trust God. He really is the good father who takes care of his children. This experience is to spread hope and faith in the sense that God cares so much about your baby. You know, you can go through the difficulties, you can have a hard time, but the Lord will deliver you and then some beyond your wildest dreams. He will deliver you and he can do things above and beyond your wildest dreams. Look at that beautiful baby. He's a miracle, and that's because of God. God is our miracle worker, and he answers prayers. I'm so excited about that testimony because we know that God has a purpose for that little one, and God has a purpose for your life and for your needs, and he wants to answer you today. The Holy Spirit is here, and we're going to pray for you, we've got some wonderful answers to prayer that we want to share with you, and then we're going to pray. We have Deborah, who is of Bangor, Pennsylvania. She developed eye problems, and she could not see clearly. As Deborah watched the 700 Club, she heard Gordon say that someone has a detached retina in the left eye, and Deborah immediately felt her eye strengthen and her vision cleared up. She knew God had answered her prayer. All right, here's one from uh, Kansas. Mark had 11 years of constant torture. He'd heard voices in his head. One day, he was watching this show, and the hosts were praying. He asked for his healing. So there wasn't a specific word of knowledge. He was just joining in a prayer for healing. And the Lord answered his prayer. Mark feels normal again, and he's no longer being tormented. In that wonderful story, just full disclosure, I, I first met Morgan when she was a teenager. The Holy Spirit pointed me out. I was speaking at her father's church, her mother and father have a church, and, and I, she was in the worship team. God spoke to me about her, and uh, we started ministering together. It's just incredible. And then uh, as she met Luke, and they started their courtship, walked through the, the, with that. She's a Regent University graduate. She now works at CBN, uh, and she got the President's Award last year. 
Uh, I was one of the friends. She calls me Uncle Gordon. I was one of the friends that was part of that walkthrough. Uh, it, it, the number of times we prayed for Simon to come into being, that is, I prayed over a baby, and then I had the great privilege of dedicating Simon to the Lord. Uh, as her parents, her grandparents gathered together, we prayed over him, anointed him. And she is just such a wonderful woman of God. It's the power of prayer. It's the power of belief when everything looks so bleak. Charlene, I've got to ask you, you went through this with oh, your own daughter. Let me tell you, my daughter and son-in-law had two children already, and they were they told, doctors told her after the second pregnancy not to have a third, not to get pregnant anymore, and she did. And they told her many times to terminate the pregnancy. I remember going with her several times to the doctor, and they told her again and again, you need to terminate this pregnancy. This baby is not going to make it. But God had another plan, and we stood on the word. Was it scary? Yes. But we had faith in God, even if it was a small faith, the size of a mustard seed, we had faith that God was going to do a miracle. Ezekiel was born, and he will be three years old in April. Amen. <laughs> That's all God's looking for. Don't make it complicated. He's just looking for that mustard seed. That little something saying, you know, hey, we're here. We need you right now. Uh, pray Psalm 91 over yourself. Hold on to the good report of the Lord. He heals all your diseases. He wants to do miracles for his children. He wants the kingdom of heaven to come to you right now. In heaven, there's no one sick. There's no one in trouble. There's no one having mental illness. There's no one poor. There's no one lonely. There's no one having any need at all because it's heaven. So in, in the wonderful Lord's Prayer, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray for that right now. Lord God Almighty, we come to you. And Lord, we say, we need you. We need your will to be done in our bodies, in our, in our lives. So we ask right now for the kingdom of heaven to come, for your righteousness to come, for your healing to come, when your righteousness comes, healing is always in the wings. So, Lord, just let your presence be all over us. Let us feel your manifest presence now. Be with us. Give us your peace. Give us your joy. And give us your healing. Your very name is healing. When we receive you, we receive the answer to every human need. Heal our bodies now. Give us the hope that we need. Give us the faith that we need in you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Charlene, God's given you something. The Lord is just speaking that his presence is here and healing is here right now, and all you have to do is believe and receive. And someone has been diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver. The Lord is healing you right now. Another person has uh, something with their pancreas. There's a mass that doctors recently found, and the Lord is healing. He is removing that right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, there's a woman you're having problems with your uterus um, and with specifically with your fallopian tubes, and God is healing you right now. He is able to take away all the inflammation, all the infection, all of the masses, all of the cysts, all of the problem. In Jesus' name, be restored and be made whole. No more problems, no more bleeding, no more issue of blood. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. Thank you, Lord. Even shingles are being healed. We just speak to shingles to be removed, to be healed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for someone who is receiving healing from headaches, Lord, migraines specifically, Lord. We thank you for healing, removing that right now, Father. There's someone you've had a fall and you fractured the, the lower part of your, your teeth and your jaw and, and it's just, I mean, your, 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 your teeth are just a mess right now. 
God is healing you. He's able to restore bone. He's able to restore jaw. He's able to restore everything concerning it right now. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for all that you do for us. We receive every blessing you have. We don't want to miss a single one. Be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we're here for you, and we're here for you 24 hours a day. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call. It's our honor, our privilege to pray with you. Welcome to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The oldest and most complete Hebrew Bible ever discovered is expected to bring 30 to 50 million dollars when it's auctioned off by Sotheby's in May. What you see behind you is a Bible written over a millennia ago, around the year 900 in the land of Israel or Syria. Before this, portions of the Bible had only appeared in Dead Sea Scrolls. Scholars have researched this Bible, and it's very, very close, almost exactly what we have today. Wow, Mintz adds that the manuscript is written in the same Hebrew script that's been used for hundreds of years. It will be coming to auction for the first time in 30 years, and Mintz says it will be the most valuable printed manuscript or historical document by estimate ever offered at auction. CBN's Operation Blessing is helping Ukrainians survive the brutal winter and Russian attacks. After months of living in constant fear for their lives, Ukrainian families like Oksana's suddenly faced a new challenge, winter without heat. Oksana said the temperature can go as low as 13 below zero Fahrenheit. Their house was heated by a boiler, but it was destroyed when the war started. But thanks to Operation Blessing supporters, teams in Ukraine are installing wood-burning stoves, providing Ukrainians with a reliable source of heat no matter what happens to the power grid because of the Russian attacks. A grateful Oksana said, if Operation Blessing had not brought us a stove and firewood, then I do not know how my children and I would have survived. Operation Blessing at it again. You can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. In a remote village in Mexico, people were getting sick and it had nothing to do with the pandemic and everything to do with the dirty water they were drinking. Grandma Asuncion and her husband are raising their granddaughter, Daniela, in a remote community in Mexico. Their greatest challenge has been finding clean water. The water situation was harsh. We got stomach sickness. We saw cattle in the water using it as a bathroom. The water was murky, and sometimes it smelled like urine, and we had to drink that. Then Grandma had to walk long distances to get the little bit of water she could carry. Sometimes it was multiple trips per day. The path to get water was narrow. We went down hills and then climbed up hills. It was a hard climb that took lots of time. As I got older, it grew more difficult because the load feels heavier. The water gave me pain in my belly. My tummy hurts every day. I often wondered if the water would make Daniela so sick she might die. Then Operation Blessing came to their community and built a rainwater harvesting system that collects and stores up to 1,300 gallons of water. We then added purification and pipes to bring fresh water to Asuncion's home. Having water in our house means I no longer have to carry it. I am just so happy. Now I can take a bath because we have enough water. I can drink the water too. Thank you. Gracias. And thank you goes from Mexico all the way to your home. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're part of providing that clean drinking water for that wonderful family. If you're not a member, I invite you to join with us. It's real simple. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club.
The basic 700 Club membership is $20 a month. We also have 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year, and that's $84 a month. At whatever level God is speaking to you to give, do it right now. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Well, Taria Walters was only 31 years old and already tired of living. Her childhood in Alaska had been a nightmare of abuse. Then she spent her teens and 20s hooked on drugs and selling her body for her next fix. Taria Walters was raised by an alcoholic father who was abusive in every way. I remember him pulling my hair, punching me, spanking me. I had no idea what being in a normal family was all about. By the time I was 11, I um, became a ward of the state. But for Teria, foster care proved to be just as chaotic. I uh, went from foster home to foster home to foster home. And that made me very rebellious. I was constantly running away. I was roaming the streets in the middle of the night, drinking alcohol. Teria's rebellion landed her in juvenile hall before she was 14 years old. But after violating her probation, she ran away for good. She left Alaska and started traveling down the West Coast. That began my time of um, using LSD. I loved it. I mean, just the things that I was seeing, how it made me feel, it actually took me out of reality. Teria's drug habit progressed into a full-blown heroin addiction before she was in her 20s. When I met heroin, it was downhill from there. It took my feelings away. It made me not have to face reality. Um, I mean, I didn't have to feel, I didn't have to face my problems. And I supported my heroin habit um, by prostituting. Teria did numerous stints in jail and even had a felony on her record. But nothing could deter her from her addictions. I would preferred to just go ahead and do my time, do jail time so that I can continue getting high rather than being on supervision, being supervised by a probation officer and not having a felony on my record. After years of running from the law and doing heroin, Teria wanted to stop. Her boyfriend suggested that she substitute heroin with meth. Being addicted to drugs and being high there was no logic. I ended up getting evicted from my place um, because I didn't pay any rent, and I had purchased a 64-foot old Greyhound bus, gutted it, and I put my furniture in it, and I moved it out into uh, Big Lake onto a piece of property. And while the guy that I was dating was cooking meth, I was learning how to do it. Before long, her life revolved around the new drug. I hated being addicted, but I loved that it took away my feelings, and I loved that it, like, made me feel good. After months of cooking meth, Teria was tired. She decided to try something she had never tried before. She prayed. I didn't like being the way that I was, and I specifically remember sitting in my bus, putting the pipe to my mouth. And I was putting the, when I was putting this pipe to my mouth, in my mind, I was saying, God, I, you know I don't want to be like this. You know, I, this is like, I'm tired of being like this. I'm tired of being addicted to drugs. Can you just take it away? So I don't want to be addicted anymore. I want to be able to stop. I just sat in it for a moment. I let it pass, and I continued to get high that day. Just two days after her prayer, Teria's bus was surrounded by the Alaska DEA. They raided the meth lab and arrested her because of her extensive record. Eventually, Teria faced 11 felony charges. I was thinking in my mind, I'm gonna be in prison for the rest of my life, my life is crap. I just had no, I had no purpose and I, you know, I just felt worthless. I was just like, God, you know, you just gotta do something. I just can't do this anymore. On her first day in prison, Teria asked for a Bible. I could not put it down. I was constantly praying. And the first thing that I read was Psalm 40, that he lifts us out of the muck and rescues us. And I desperately wanted that. 
When I finally had like come to my to a place of like realizing that how much I really needed God, I just I mean, I completely just fully surrendered and said, "You know what, God? I give my life completely to you. Do with it what you want. Do with me what you want. Change my life. Just make me the person that you intended me to be from the very beginning." Throughout her sentence, Teria continued to seek God and later became the chaplain's assistant. She graduated from a Christian recovery program and was released five years later on parole. Today, she is active in her church, has a great job, and talks about God wherever she goes. Being in His Word and just having, getting to know who I am, who, getting to know who He is, the, that I have a purpose, that He has a plan for my life, that I matter, that I'm worthy, and most of all, that He's my Father. Jesus is the answer. And if He can change my life, He can change anybody's life. Surrender your life to Him, get to know who He is, and watch what He does. He can make you a totally different person. He can remake you. Here's the Psalm she's talking about. It's Psalm 40, verse 2. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the mud, and he set my feet on a rock, making my footsteps firm. You can claim that. God will bring you out of a pit of destruction. Now, what do you have to do first? Well, the same psalm gives you that. You have to cry out to him. Verse 1, he heard my cry. In Terry's story, here she is. She's getting high. And she's saying, I don't want this anymore. I don't want to live this way. I don't want to go from, you know, addiction and compulsion. I, I want to be freed from this. And so she prayed. She asked God for it. And then God answered her prayer, did so in an unusual way by having her arrested so that she could actually spend time alone with him. And that's the other key. Wait on the Lord. He will answer that prayer. He will do it. He will bring you out of the pit of destruction. Then the psalm goes on in verse 3. He put a song in my heart. Just imagine you can have a song in your heart. You can be happy facing life. You can have a new life, new joy. Wake up every day saying, okay, God, what good things do you have for me today? How can I, how can I help you today? Uh, how can I be part of your plan today? Put that new song into my heart. You can have these things. Why do I speak so confidently about this? Because that same God did the same thing for me. If he can do it for me, he can do it for you. If he can do it for Terry, he can do it for you. All you have to do is ask. That's all. It's that simple. He's just looking for that little sign. If you want this, cry out to him right now. Let's pray and let's believe and God will answer your prayer. Lord God, I come to you. Jesus, I come to you. And I ask that you would be my Savior. I see what you've done for others. And Jesus, I need that. I need to be delivered. I need to be set free. I need to be established in you. And Jesus... If you do this for me, if you forgive me of all the things that I've done wrong, if you set me free from addiction, from compulsion, from all the things that hinder me, if you set me free, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer. Come into my heart. Give me a new song, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to let somebody know. It's real simple. Pick up a phone, call 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I prayed with that guy on TV. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. When you call, I've got a free packet for you. What do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? Phone call's free. It's all free. Do it now. Here's a word from Peter. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. God bless.